Hey man, it is a blessing to be here. It's, I think, the third time or so that I have preached here in this capacity as director for church planting, director for Association of Independent Baptist Church of Illinois, and uh, kids can be dismissed for children's church. I'm sorry. Yeah, go. <laughs> I do that in my church. I should have just done it. It was a natural, uh, natural sequence there. What a blessing to see so many of you here, see new faces. That's exciting. Um, I remember now over eight years ago, probably 10 years ago, that uh, Brother Nathan met with our board and uh, discussed the opportunity to plant uh, a Baptist church in this area. And uh, certainly was an exciting time. That is our purpose. It is exactly what we're about we are praying now and i hope you'll pray with us for the next uh barber family and uh church and area and uh, there's no lack of people there's no lack of areas to start churches uh, that's for sure but um we are praying the lord would send forth laborers uh, into his harvest and we're excited about that um hearing the barbers sing i uh, in 1990, the Lord called my family to go to Long Island, New York, and start a church there. And we were there for 11 years, started Bayview Baptist Church. We were about five blocks from the ocean. And uh, God bless us. And if you know anything about Long Island, we're on, we're on the south shore, about 70 miles out from the city. And the uh, Lord blessed us there, and we saw many people saved. And, and uh, just it was an exciting time. But I, I just, when I see the family... Um, I just remember our family did everything at the beginning. It was, we, we, we were the singing, we were my wife. I always kid, she probably didn't hear me preach for the first year or so. Um, she was either in the nursery or junior church or Sunday school or uh, somewhere like that. And uh, there were times when I preached. Uh, it's always fun to preach to your family, you know. Um, usually it was, uh, so there were times when it was just my family and one man. We had a man, an elderly man who lived near the church. He was there all the time. Uh, but we had some evening services, particularly when it was just us. And uh, God, God bless. And just, but it's exciting. It, it, it just brings back a lot of memories. We've now been in Pecatonica for 20 years. And uh, we're coming to the end of our third year as uh, director. My son is preaching uh, for me this morning. As my, he's my assistant. And so when I'm gone preaching, he is, uh, he is there preaching for me. And I appreciate uh, his faithfulness to that. Take your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 1, if you would. And when you get to Acts chapter 1, kind of put your finger there and go back, if you would, to Luke 24. We're going to read two short passages of Scripture. As, uh, as we read them, you're going to recognize and realize that I probably could just about read just one of them. Uh, they are a lot alike. And um, if you... Recognize, I'm sure, that Luke uh, wrote the Gospel of Luke, but he also wrote then the book of Acts. And he tells us in Luke that he begins to write the things, the form, he writes to Theophilus. He says that to Theophilus that he's writing unto him the things that Jesus began both to do and teach. And he began to do those things, and then we come to the book of Acts, and of course, we find the end of Jesus' life, the end of his ministry, and he is relating to the apostles, to the disciples, to that really 120 in the upper room, exactly what he wants for them as he goes away. And he is challenging them as the church to carry out his commandments, to take his work, his uh the things that he began both to do and teach, and now to pass that on and to continue it um, into that first century church and into the things that uh, God wants him to do. But let's look here at Luke 24, verse 46. The Bible says there, And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. 
And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye to the city in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. If you look over then at Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 3, he says, To whom also ye showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye are baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, in Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. If you jump down to verse 15, he says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about an hundred and twenty. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for the word of God. We're thankful for the church. Thankful for this church, for Pastor Barber, his family. Thankful for these folks that have come and have committed themselves, and perhaps we have visitors that they would see today the true purpose of the church and the, uh, the, the, the power that you give us through your word by your Holy Spirit, Lord, to save souls. Lord, our purpose is that souls might come to know you, that, that they might be saved and trust in the blood of, that was shed for us on Calvary. That they might know the resurrection and, Lord, that they might see all that you have done for them and with them and will do through them. Lord, we pray that we could be an encouragement to the church today. We pray, Lord, we can be a challenge to them. But, Lord, most of all, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts. And that, Lord, it not be my words, but it be the, your words that you would speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, the writer Luke is the writer of both this book, Acts, and the Gospel of Luke. Um, he writes to Theophilus in both cases. We're not told exactly who Theophilus was, but he writes to him. And he tells him about the acts that Jesus did in the Gospel of Luke. Luke is the longest of the Gospels. Uh, Luke was a doctor. Uh, you know that we have four Gospels. The Gospels have different purposes, uh, different emphasis, if you will. And in, in this case, Luke, as a doctor, was emphasizing Jesus as a man, as the man of God, the, the man who had come to earth and become a human, that he might die for our sins. And Luke goes through all that. He gives us tremendous insight into the life, the physical life even, of, of Jesus, but not forgetting that, of course, he was God come in the flesh. And so as he writes the, the, the story of, of Jesus, God then inspires him also to write the history of the church that he that would continue after Jesus passed off the scene. And so as the Lord is leaving, he has warned the disciples. He's done it, if you read the Gospel of John, um, from about chapter 13 on to the end, um, Jesus is warning them, he's telling them. And even before that, um, he tells them, I'm going away. He said, I, I, you know, we come to John 14, he says, uh, you know, comfort yourselves. If there, I go to prepare a place for you, if, there was not, if I go not to prepare a place for you, you, you can come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. And he, he promises that to us. And he gives us this, this story. But as he comes to the end of his life, he's preparing for that next generation, for that church to continue. You know, one of the things we often, and, and for, for me, and I know it's probably true for uh, Brother Barber, and for any, really, any pastor or any church planter particularly, when you 
put the effort into planting a church, one of the things you, you realize, it becomes like your baby. It's like a child. Uh, you're birthing it. We talk about starting or birthing a church. I mean, you're, you're, you're birthing it. I, I, I don't, uh, thankfully, I've never had to go through the pain of childbirth, but I think sometimes birthing a church is probably just about as, uh, you know, as painful at times. But you're, you're putting that effort into it. And one of the things you want is that longevity. You want it to continue. Uh, you know, Brother Barber's young. I, how old are you, Brother? 40, man, alive. He is young, very young. It gets younger every day as, as I get older every day. But, um, you know, at his age, you know, he's got many, many years uh, to go. I'm going to be 62 this year in, in a little bit. And um, I, I, I realize that there's, there's down the road here, there's coming an end to my, uh, my ministry. But one of the things that we're promised in Scripture, that Jesus promised in Matthew 16, 18, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. In other words, the church is always going to exist. Now, sometimes it had to go underground. Sometimes in the dark ages and other times it, you, it was hard to find. But there were, have always been churches that believed this book, that preached this book, that won people to Christ, that sent out missionaries, that did the things that we do as an independent Baptist church or an independent New Testament church. God, God has given to us instruction of how to let it and how to have it continue. Those instructions are how we start. Those instructions are how we continue. Those instructions are how we can go forward for God and how the church can continue until Jesus comes again. For that is, as we'll see in this, in this passage of Scripture, that is our timeline. We are to continue. We're to do what you're doing, what our church is doing, what all churches that believe, again, New Testament churches that are following the scriptures and teaching the word of God, what we are doing until he comes again. The Bible says in Revelation 2 and 3 that we have, the churches have a candlestick in heaven. I don't know exactly how God does that, but we're not the light, right? Jesus is the light, but we are the candlestick. And God wants us to continue. He warns those churches, listen, if you don't do what's right, if you don't follow what's right, I'm going to remove your candlestick. You cease to be a church. Well, you can drive by a lot of buildings today that have the name church on them that are not churches. They've ceased to be what God in his word says we ought to be. Why do we start? Why does Shorewood Baptist Church start? Are there not other churches in the area? Certainly there are. But the truth is, many of them have lost their candlestick. They've stopped doing what God wants us to do. They've stopped following the New Testament. They've stopped doing the things that God has laid out for us. And I thank God. I thank God for the barbers. I, I, and again, I remember sitting in that room and him filling out the, you know, the, uh, the application is too long. Anyway, <laughs> the application and all these things and answering all these questions and but we want to start churches that are according to this book. And God has given us that opportunity. He's, he's given us instruction. The word of God is not just descriptive, but it's prescriptive. It tells us how to do things and what we should do. And, and, and takes us on, the, on that journey, if you will. And we find that here even in these early chapters of Acts and at the end of Luke. And so this morning as we look at this passage of scripture, I want you to see the instructions of Jesus before he ascended into heaven, and they're very important not only for that early church in the book of Acts, but for you and I today. And to see exactly what God wants for us and what, he, what he's given to us. And we're going to jump back and forth a little bit, Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1. But if you go back to Luke 24... You go back to Luke 24, I want you to see, first of all, that Jesus gave us a true message for the church. Now, there's a lot of different messages that churches have today. There's a lot of different, uh, you know, taglines, and we have a church in our area who their tagline is, a different way to do church. That tells you a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> 
I don't, not sure. And now listen, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we shouldn't modernize. I'm not saying we can't have, you know, electric pianos. We, in our church, we put the screen down and we put the words on the, on the wall, you know, and we do, some of that got a lot better during COVID. We didn't have much choice, you know, in some of those things. And, and uh, so I'm not saying we don't, you know, change a little bit over the years, but uh, we're not going to change the message. We're not going to change what we're preaching. We're going to change that we are preaching. Our, our, our purpose is not just to entertain. Our purpose is not to have a different way to do church. Our purpose is to do church according to this book. And so God gave us, Jesus gave us a true message for the church. You'll find here in verse 46, and he said unto them, thus it, behoo it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. We see here it was imperative that Jesus die for our sins and rise from the dead. That's the message, isn't it? That's the gospel. That, that's, what we, that's what we preach. We're not trying to water it down. We're not trying to make it acceptable. We're not trying to tickle people's ears. And we're not on the other side trying to offend people. I'm not saying that. But we are endeavoring to give the truth. You know as well as I do, if you give somebody the gospel, there are times when the gospel offends. The book of Acts, as you get into the beginning of Acts, and Peter begins to preach, and John begins to preach, and Stephen preaches, and Philip preaches, and you find all these different men that are giving the gospel as well as the all the other disciples. And what does it do? It, it, it begins to offend. People begin to persecute. People begin to get upset. That you're, you know, the people are being saved. The first time Peter and John are put in prison in Acts chapter 4, the Bible says 5,000 people got saved. Men got saved. I mean, many believe by that point the church was about 20,000 people. Now, it was meeting in houses. It was meeting in places. It was, but it was exploding. Why? Because the message of the gospel was going forth. I like the word that it says there, it behooved Christ. Do you realize there's no other way of salvation? Peter makes it clear in, John, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Hebrews 3, or 2, verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? There's not a lot of ways to be saved. There's one way to be saved. I, I, I do a... Uh, some VBSs, or I used to when I was younger, 42 or whatever, uh, you know, when I was younger and had the energy to do some of that. But there's a trick that I do. I, I, I have a box full. My grandkids are always saying, Grandpa, do, do a trick. Get, teach us a trick. So the one year at Christmas time, I taught them each a trick, and then they did a magic show and all that. So, so I have this box of magic tricks that we do. And a lot of them I did to show the gospel in one way or another. And one of them is a... Uh, what looks like a dice, and anyway, explain it to you, but the whole thing is that there are not six ways, or not four ways, or not three ways, there are not two ways, there's only one way to heaven. And you end up with one, th anyway, you get it. But, but the point is, there are not six ways. There are not three ways. There are not four ways. There, there, there's one way to be saved. And the Bible says it behooved Christ that he would die. Why? Because he's the only one who could. I think we understand that, right? As God come in the flesh, he's the only one. Perfect, without sin, the spotless Lamb of God. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That picture of those sacrifices in the Old Testament, that lamb without a spot, without blemish, Peter says that his blood were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot, without blemish. Perfect. He's the only one. It's imperative that he die for our sin because he's the only one that could. And as he was imperative that we could not pay for our own sin, the Bible makes it very clear by faith, by grace through faith we're saved, not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. We can't pay for our own sin. 
I don't care how good you try to be. I don't care how, how, how religious, how, you know, Jesus looked at the Pharisees who were more religious than any of us would ever be. And he said to them, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. What was he saying? He wasn't saying you have to be more perfect like them. He was saying you need God to give you righteousness. Romans 3 tells us that we receive the righteousness of God by faith. When I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary's cross for me, when I understand that he rose from the dead, when I understand that he paid for my, as, as God come in the flesh and he laid aside the, the, the voluntary use of those attributes and he went to the cross and he died on the cross for my sin, that message, that message of love, people want to say, oh, the God, the God of, of, of holiness is, 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 why would God allow this or why would God do that? Listen, our God, nobody loves you like the Lord Jesus Christ loved you. People can throw around John 3.16, but it's the greatest truth in Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Romans 5.8 is my favorite verse in Scripture. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why does this church exist today? It exists to give the gospel. It exists to give the message because it's the only message that people can be saved. It's the message that Peter preached in, John, in Acts 3. It's the message that Peter preached in Acts 4. He said to the Jews, he said, this Jesus, this Messiah that you have rejected. Folks, the fact that the gospel is the only way of salvation does not mean everybody's going to accept it. Right? I mean, as Jesus came face to face with those who should have understood those who knew the Old Testament, those who knew exactly what they, they should have been able to see in Jesus, rejected him. Rejected him. Peter, Peter makes it very clear. I, Peter never minced any words. By this point, Peter was pretty, uh, you know, he had always had a mouth on him, you know. That was, that was one of the things. But by this point now, in the gospel, he just, he's just saying, it's you, you've crucified. You, you but you know, folks, he could have been pointing to us. It's my sin that put him on the cross. It's your sin that put him on the cross. But he loved me, he commended his love toward me, and while I was a sinner, he died for me. It is, it is imperative that Jesus die for our sins and rise again. It is imperative that men repent in order to have their sins forgiven. You think about this message. The message is Jesus died. He rose again. He's available. The gospel is available to you. But he goes on in verse 47. He says, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. In other words, the remission of sins is not in your name. It's not in anyone. It's in his name. In the name of Jesus, my sins can be forgiven. In the name of Jesus, I can come to him in repentance of faith. Repentance that of my unbelief and putting my faith and trust in him. Acts 20, 21, Paul said, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's your salvation. Repentance is not knowing every sin you ever commit. It's not even being willing to put all your sin away. But it's willing to understand I am a sinner my unbelief, I've been trusting in something else. I've been living some other way. But I want to turn and put my faith in what Jesus Christ did for me. That's what he says in Luke 24. That repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name. Beginning at Jerusalem. We know that they began there. Didn't stop there. I was trying to find a timeline Bible doesn't really give us dates and years and things like that for the book of Acts. And it seems like from the beginning when Jesus ascended till the church begins to be scattered in Acts 8 and they reach to the Samaritans, it's about six or seven years. So from Acts 1 to Acts 8, about six or seven years. From Acts 8 to Acts 13, when missions, Antioch is the, is the main church and people begin to go everywhere around the world preaching the gospel. Paul takes his missionary journeys about another three years. So we're talking about seven, eight, nine years of, of 
ministry of the church in existence. And just, I, I looked it up because you were having your eighth anniversary. I thought, wouldn't it be cool if it was eight years? Well, it's not exactly eight years, so I, but, but anyway, that's beside the point. Next year, it'd be nine years, you'd be right there. <laughs> but the truth is, is that the church in its existence had one message. And that message was, of course, Christ. That message was Jesus as, as they preached him, as they witnessed of him. The Bible makes it clear that, they, that God was giving to them. He says here, he says, ye are witnesses. He wants them to understand that it was imperative, the need for repentance, the need to come and have your sins remitted, have your sins taken care of. That's the message of the church. Now, we go beyond that. We're commanded to disciple, we're commanded to teach, we're commanded to do to, to, to ordinances and put all these things together that make up the church. But if we don't start with the message, if we don't start with the truth that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, that we must come to him in repentance and faith and trust him as our Savior, and believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, Romans 10, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God has given us a message. Folks, don't ever let that message slip. We have a message from God. And it behooved him. It was, it was imperative that he die. And it's imperative that you come to him in repentance and faith. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, that's why you're here. You may have thought you were coming for the potluck. But you're here because Jesus loved you and died for you. And somebody else loved you enough to invite you. And somebody else loved you enough to start this church and be a part of that without even knowing you. It's imperative. So we see Jesus gives us a true message for the church. Secondly, Jesus gave them two commandments. Jesus gave them two commandments. The, the, in Acts chapter 1 and, and verse 4, the Bible says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. He tells them in Luke 24 to wait. He tells them to wait. So they were to wait. The commandment, the first commandment was to wait for the Holy Spirit to come and take his place. Now, Jesus had been preparing them. He had said, I'm going away. And if I go away, I will send the comforter unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Jesus said that the same message that he preached, the same work that he did when he was here on earth. As he went back to the Father, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, God in, in spirit came to this earth. And he tells them, wait for that filling, for that coming of the Holy Spirit, for that work of the Holy Spirit. For he's the one who will work in the lives of those you minister to. Back in John chapter 14. He tells them that the Spirit of God, again, he says in verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But he knoweth him, and for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Let a, let a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. In that, at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Spirit was going to come, and we know he came on the day of Pentecost, we know there's three, three main events in which the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. The Jews at Pentecost, the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, and the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. 
Those three times, God is showing that all men are the same. Same spirit comes to all of them. All of them, come, it comes upon them. And when you trusted Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit indwelt you permanently. Jesus said to them, he's, he, in the Old Testament, he was with you. In other words, he came upon them for certain things, certain ministries, certain times. But he shall be in you. That permanent indwelling, that change. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away, but all things become new. Why? Because the Spirit of God comes to live within us. The Bible says in John 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, He says, Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. What was he saying? Nicodemus said, can I enter a second time in my mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, no, no. He said, you don't understand. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. He said, you've been born once of water. Now you'll be born of the spirit. You'll be born again. Well, what a, what a great, great picture. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God said, you eat of that tree, you're going to die. What happened? They didn't just kill over dead. The process of death began, but they didn't die immediately. What did die? Their spirit. The part of them that fellowship with God. The part of them that walked with God. The part of them that had a relationship with God now was gone. What did they do? They hid in a bush. They hid in a bush because they weren't right with God. They weren't part with God. They didn't have that relationship. That hole in them, that place that God had filled up to that point was missing. You and I need that hole to be filled again. And when we trust Christ as our Savior, it behooved him to die for us. And when he died for us, and we come to him in repentance and faith, what happens? He fills that. He comes to live within us, and he gives us everlasting life. And he makes our spirit alive again. So now I can pray. Now I can come to him. Now I can walk with him. Now he works in me. I mean, the, the coming of the Spirit of God was that which they needed and which you and I need as well. The Bible tells us that they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, that idea of being immersed. Jesus said you were immersed with water at John's baptism, but you'll be filled and immersed with the Holy Spirit. God said you're going to be, they were to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. What else were they to do? They were to witness through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not only were they to wait for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but they were to witness. He says, whereof ye are witnesses. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. They were to witness through the power of the Holy Spirit of that which happened to them. Ye are witnesses. Folks, how is it that we can witness about salvation? Now, there have been those who have tried to do it without being saved. Think that would work very well? I think God can use his word however it goes forth, okay? So if God wants to save somebody through a lost person, I got no problem with that. But I don't think it works very well. God wants us, you and I, if you've received Christ as your Savior, he wants us to witness of what we have. We witness to our children. We witness to those around us. We witness to our co-workers. We witness. We witness by the life that we live. But let me, can I just say this? In, in the book of Acts, the witness was certainly about a life. They took knowledge that they'd been with Jesus. They, they saw these of the way. They, they understood that there was a change in these people's lives. But the message was not just lived, it was spoken. It was witnessed of. Folks, can I tell you the greatest tool to witness the lost person that you have is your testimony. It's how you got saved. What God did in your life. And Jesus makes it clear. He commands us. Whereof you are a witness. I'm just talking to the disciples. They had seen it. They had seen the Lord after his resurrection. They, they knew all these things. And so that, their witness, first one eyewitness of it. But you know, Peter says later on, in 2 Peter 1, he says, you know what? There is a more sure word of testimony than the fact that I saw the Lord after his resurrection. You know what it is? 
It's this book. The fact that we are given the stories of Jesus, the fact that we are told how he rose from the dead, how he died on the cross for our sin, the fact that we are given all that in his book, inspired by God and by his Holy Spirit, spoken of to us, I can with confidence go to people and say, listen, this is what the Bible, this is the truth. This is what the Bible says. This is what you have to do. This is what Jesus did for us. This is how he rose from the dead. This is how he died on the cross. This is how. This is this is the truth. And you know what? The Spirit of God uses this book and your testimony and your mouth, your message, to bring people to himself. You think of the people involved in your life when you got saved that showed you how to be saved. For me, I was saved as a child. But you know what? I got saved because I had Sunday school teachers. My parents both worked. I went to a babysitter on a regular basis, particularly in the summer. This was before I went to school. I was five years old. Lorraine Phillips sat myself and her daughter on a couch. I could take you to the place. I could take you to the house. I don't, know if it's still, I don't even know if it's still standing. But I could take you to the place where it is, Perkinsie, Pennsylvania. I could bring you into that house. If it's, all, if it's the same, I could sit you down. I'm sure it's not the same couch. I could sit you down, and I could show you where she gave the gospel again. And then she gave an invitation. It was great. Close your eyes. Raise your hand if you want to be saved. Pray after me. And I did. Her daughter didn't. And when I got up, of course, I was a snotty little five-year-old. I said, I'm going to heaven. You're going to hell. <laughs> But I got saved. That's my testimony. He said, well, that's not, you know, God didn't save you from this horrible life of sin. Yes, he did. He kept me from a horrible life of sin. And he saved me. My sin at that point was as bad as anybody's. I was a sinner. On my way to hell, my witness, my testimony is simple. But it's, it's sure. It, it, it's, it's the same as yours. I mean, there's different, I, I, I've been studying through the book of Acts, and there's all kinds, of, there's all different conversion experiences. Saul's was different than Cornelius's, and Cornelius was different than the Ethiopian eunuch, and, but they all had the same element. It was all about Jesus. And they witnessed. Folks, God's given us the message, the true message. God's given us two commands. Lastly, Jesus gave us a timeline for the church. He gave us a timeline for the church. Again, Acts 24, or Acts 1, I'm sorry, Luke 24. What happens? Jesus has finished. It's about 40 days or so that he's here on the earth after his resurrection. And he's done. They, he establishes uh, he, he's already established the Lord's Supper beforehand. He, he dies on the cross. He rose from the dead. For 40 days, he basically teaches them. We have a few incidents, few uh, stories about that. We know about Peter, you know, feed my sheep. You love me. Uh, we know about Thomas, who was doubting, you know, in, in, in the upper room. And, and uh, he missed, uh, you know, he missed uh, Jesus being there. And Jesus says to him, Thomas, it's great that you believe, but blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That's you and me. Okay? By faith. And the Lord goes out to the Mount of Olives. And the Bible tells us that he ascended. His last words, he ascended up into heaven. And so we understand that the church began. He said, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the disciples. And he gave them the great commission. He gave them the ordinances. He gave them everything that the church is about. And he taught them and he encouraged them. And then on the day of Pentecost, they're going to be indwelt. And the power of the Spirit of God is going to fill the church. And it's going to go forward. It's going to explode for, for, for Christ. And we find the beginning is there. Jesus' death, burial, resurrection. We have the message. We have the commandments. The Spirit of God now comes upon them, fills the church. But what's the end? Well, the Bible tells us. Acts 
And the angel stood there and said, men of, man and brother, why stand you gazing up into heaven? I, can you imagine? I'd have been the same way, wouldn't you? You know, tongue out, mouth open. I'd have, I'd have been the same way. Why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus shall so come again, like manner as you see him go. So we know what the beginning of the church was, and we know what the end of the church will be. Our blessed hope, Jesus is coming again, amen? amen. Rapture is going to take place, we're going to go to be with him. Tribulation will take place here on earth, he's going to come back. Second time, start his kingdom here on this earth. You notice the disciples in Luke 24, they said, Lord, when are you going to establish your kingdom? They figured, man, you died, you rose again, it's time, let's go, you're the king. He says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons. You don't know when that's going to happen. What are we supposed to do? Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost. Till when? Till when? Till we build a church that's self-supporting? No. Folks, don't wait. Don't wait, and I'm not your pastor, and I'm not, I'm just, I'm just telling you, don't, don't wait till you've reached all of Joliet and Shorewood before you begin to reach your Samaria, your Judea, your Judea, your uttermost. Why? Because the Bible says both, completely, all at the same time. Do you know when you begin to give so that others might hear? When you begin to send forth and, and let people around the world hear? You know, when Paul said, I don't desire a gift from you. I desire fruit that may abound to your account. There's an opportunity. We have a job. We have a responsibility. From his first coming to his second coming, we are to take the gospel around the world. It's imperative. It's the only way. We are to do it until he comes. Folks, listen, I, I don't know when this is. Everybody in my lifetime, preachers as I was growing up, you know, a couple things have happened. Big, big dates in my life, okay? Big times. 1976, the, the bicentennial. America, 200 years old. Countries don't last that long. Certainly Christ is going to come back in 1976. Didn't happen. Best thing happened that year was my wife graduated from high school. Didn't happen. 2000. Remember Y2K? I remember we were in New York. Oh, man. Everything's going to explode. Everything's going to break. Your computers are all going to fail. Nothing's going to work. Nothing knows how to, I, I don't know why they thought nothing can change from 1999 to 2000. I, I remember sitting there, midnight. My kids, this was great. Everybody's talking about how everything's going to be, explode, everything's going to be terrible. And, and you just wanted to watch it happen. I didn't know what was going to happen. You're watching, a, you know, we always watch the ball drop, you know, and nothing. <laughs> nothing. I was so disappointed. No, I wasn't. I was. Nothing. You know, how many times? I, I, I've, I've heard preachers on the radio talk about the end of the world. I've heard preachers talk about dates when Christ will come. And the only thing you know about that is when they set a date, that's not when it's happening. That's the only thing you know. Folks, we don't know when this is. It could be tonight. It could be a thousand years from now. You say, oh, no, preacher, no, it's not going to be a thousand years from now. Do you realize that that early church and the Apostle Paul thought Christ was coming in his lifetime? It's been 2,000 years. You think he thought it could possibly go 2,000 years? No way. No way. That does not give us an excuse, though. God didn't tell us when, and he didn't tell us when for a reason. He doesn't want us to know. Because he wants us to be doing what we're supposed to be doing, 
with the message of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit, and he wants us to take it around the world. And he started it here, and he's going to end it over here, but we don't know when this is. So until that happens, we're going to keep doing this. We're going to keep starting churches. We're going to keep witnessing the people. We're going to keep doing things that God wants us to do. Why? Because he hasn't come yet. I mean, Illinois is the second... More, the second most people are moving out of Illinois than any state in the union. Does that mean we just shut it down? No. Man, if any place needs churches, it's Illinois. If anybody needs the gospel, it's Illinois. You guys, I, in Chicago, I mean, you could take your finger in about any suburb. You can say, well, it would be good if we had a church there. Be good if we had a church here. Be good if we had a church here. There was a day where I live. I live in a small town, just west of Rockford. My son just had a visit. Uh, he used to pastored in, it was an assistant pastor in Virginia, and one of his best friends that he led to the Lord and discipled came out this weekend to visit him. <laughs> and, and we live in a small town. But he didn't realize that we live in a small town 10 miles west of Rockford. Rockford's 150,000 people, plus some of the suburbs, 200, 250,000 people. And he asked Chad, he said, he said, now, is there a Walmart nearby? Chad's like, you know that this is a city, right? You, under, you understand that we're, we're, not, we're not so out in the boonies, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, can you go stand in the middle of a cornfield and see nothing but corn? Absolutely. So it makes it great. You can also go in the city and be in traffic if you want. You know, but but we, we've had in our area, we've had some of these small town churches, and some of them have closed, and some things have happened. But, Folks, listen, it doesn't mean we need, we need churches. We need areas of, of, for the gospel. We need men and families who will, who will give themselves and people who will give themselves to, to, to start a church, to, to, to be a part of that. Why? Because Christ hasn't come yet. We have a timeline. We have a beginning. We have an end. The thing we don't know is where we are in here. We don't know. And so until he comes again, I want to be found faithful, doing what he's asked me to do. Witnessing of what Christ did for me. Taking the gospel, giving, praying, serving. I tell you, it was exciting walking in the doors this morning, seeing the bustle, seeing the, the, the people doing stuff. And, and, and that's life, man. That's life. I, you know, I'm sure you'd be glad if you didn't have to set up. You'd be glad if you didn't have to do all that stuff. I'm sure you would. But it's life, man. It, it, it's, it's just, it, it's exciting. Folks, let's not quit doing what we're doing. Eight years. What a great, great testimony. Is that the end? Man, it's just a beginning. It's just a beginning. There are missionaries to support. There are people to win. There are works to do. There are ministries to start. There are stuff that God wants you to do. Don't stop until he comes again. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful. Oh, it behooved you to die on the cross for our sins. So thankful for your salvation. Thankful for saving me, thankful for calling me and allowing me to preach your word and to speak your word. And Lord, each of us has a testimony. I pray if there's somebody here this morning that doesn't know you, that Lord, you would burden their heart to trust you as their savior. It's the only way, it behooved Christ to die. Why? Because it's the only way, he's the only one who could. Lord, thank you for coming, dying, rising, ascending, our intercessor, our mediator. Lord, again, work in our hearts, work in this church. I thank you for pastor and his family. Lord, bless them in a special way for their faithfulness. But Lord, keep them faithful. Help them to be faithful the years to come for this church to grow. Lord, not to have a big number, but that it might do more and reach more people for Christ. Help them to reach there's Judea and Samaria and the uttermost to do more for you. Lord, we, we just commit this church to you. It's your church, Lord. Do your work by your spirit. 
For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Myers. You know, just before we, uh, before we close up, you know, let me have a heads bowed and eyes closed. I always like to give an invitation. And, uh, you know, as Pastor Myers is preaching about the, the message, uh, there's two applications there. You know, the first is maybe as he was describing that message that we're saved by faith in Christ and trust in Christ, that repentance and faith, um, realizing that there's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to save ourselves. Uh, we have to, to repent of the notion that we can make it simply by following Jesus' example or some other religious teacher. We have to repent of that. We have to place our faith in Jesus. How many of you would say, you know what, I don't know if there's been a time that I have placed my faith where I fully embraced that message. It might be today is the first time you've even heard it. Um, and you'd say, you know what, maybe you need to know more about it. But you'd say, you know what, I don't know if there's been a time in my life when I have embraced that message for my own soul, for the saving of my own soul. Would there be anyone today, just by the upraised hand, no one looking around but me, um, they, they would say, you know what, I just I would like to admit the need. I won't call you out or embarrass you. I'd love to just pray for you in a general way here uh, that you would uh, uh, understand that message and embrace that message. Would there be anyone like that just by the upraised hand who say, please pray for me. I do not know that I have embraced that message that was preached today for the saving of my soul. Anyone like that, I'd love to pray for you. How many of you say, you know what? I have embraced that message, but God has convicted me. Um, I've kept it to myself. Maybe there's a, someone in specific that God, you know God has said you need to be a witness to that individual. And for whatever reason, you just haven't. Maybe they haven't. Maybe you've tried in the past, and they've turned away from it. Uh, you got discouraged. Or maybe there's just someone you just know you needed to have said something. Maybe the start sometimes is just inviting to church. Maybe give them a gospel tract. Uh, simply, as we heard today, just be in that witness. Let folks, no one can argue with your testimony. If it happened to you, they can't say otherwise. Yeah, no. Just start there. And you say, you know what? Yes, God has convicted me. There is someone I can think of right now that the Lord has told me I need to start a spiritual conversation with that individual. I have not done it. And please pray for me. Anyone like that with the upraised hand, I'd love to pray for you. Amen, amen, amen. And we got to keep that up till he comes. Keep being witnesses. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for... Uh, that great message today, Lord, what an encouragement it is. And, Lord, I thank you that you did wait to come. Lord, if you had come a thousand years ago, I never would have been born. I couldn't be a part of all this. And I thank you that you, you're waiting. As difficult as it is for us to wait and as tough as things are down here, you created us because you love us. And, Lord, we know that you tarry because new people are being born into the world that you want to be reached every day. And you're filling up heaven right now. Yes. And I thank you that you give us the opportunity to be a part of this, to be the reapers going out into the harvest fields and finding those who are ready, scattering the seed, upon all kinds of ground, even the, the hard ground, because you just never know when that ground will receive the fruit and when people will respond in faith. You just never know. And thank you that we get to be a part of it. And Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us. Lord, I'm sure all of our hands could have been upraised, but I, I thank you for each one who raised the hand, who said, I know of someone specific. God's put upon my heart. I need to at least just start with sharing my testimony or Maybe if that's too much, just inviting them to church, just taking some step to try to engage the, these loved ones. Lord, give the grace and give an opportunity. Lord, if Paul had to ask for open doors, so do we. And I pray you even give an opportunity this week that each of these can seize and maybe even make an opportunity, of, an opportunity for interaction so that we can reach these. Lord, we don't know if you come back today. We don't know when our opportunity to be that witness could be over. 
Help us to seize the opportunities that you put in front of us and give grace. And we want to thank you for the victory ahead of time. We're more than conquerors. You've given us all that we need. We want to rejoice that you're going to work. You're going to use us. You're going to answer prayer, Lord, as, as we requested and as we prayed. Lord, thank you now for what you're going to do um, through us in the days to come. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this time, I want uh, just before we conclude the service, we're going to have our offering. So I'm going to ask if our ushers would come at this time. If you have made a decision for the Lord, uh, whether you've placed your faith in the Lord for the first time or maybe you want prayer about something, uh, regardless, make sure to turn that connection card in so we've got a record of your visit. If you have a prayer request, make sure uh, to put that um, on that sheet and we can pass those in. So, uh, Nathan, would you pray for God's blessing on the offering? Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for the eight years that our church has been in existence here. Um, and uh, please help uh, the gift that we have today and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're praying a lot in this service, but I'm going to pray again for the food. We have a potluck. You're all welcome. I'm going to pray God's blessing on the food now for everyone. I hope you can stay. It'll be a great time of fellowship. We have our, our new fellowship hall all set up and ready to go. Lots of food. It's going to be a great time. If you can stay, we'd love to have you. So let's close the service now with prayer. Father, thank you so much for our time together. Thank you, Lord, for feeding us from the Word of God. Thank you now that we can uh, share uh, a table with one another and share some food and some fellowship. Lord, we thank you for each one um, that you brought here today. I pray you just uh, bless our time together, bless the food. We thank you so much for the uh, abundance that you have given us that we can uh, enjoy today. And we just give you the praise for it and the honor. Thank you, Lord, for the great time here this morning. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.